Well, welcome everyone. On behalf of the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's online lecture. My name is Nicholas Herman, and I am the Lawrence J. Schoenberg Curator here at SIMS. Today's online lecture is presented by Andrew Turner, uh, and I'll be introducing him in just a moment. But before I do so, I have a few announcements and logistical items to share. While we have yet to announce the next online lecture, we do have a number of upcoming dates to note on your calendars. Our Graduate Student Research Fellowship, which offers an MA or PhD student in the Philadelphia area a funded opportunity to spend an academic year affiliated with SIMS while working on their own research project at the Kislak Center, uh, is now open for applications and the deadline is uh, May 1st. Details can be found on our website at schoenberginstitute.org. And our visiting research fellowship, which allows scholars uh, at any level, uh, 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 allow scholars at any level a period of up to a month uh, in residency in Philadelphia, uh, working with us at SIMS. Um, these fellowships are also open to applicants, and the deadline for that is May 15th. And again, information is uh, available on our website. Uh, another item of note coming up in the next month uh, related to the Schoenberg Institute. If you're planning to attend the International Congress of Medieval Studies at Kalamazoo uh, next month, either online or in person, please consider attending the three SIM-sponsored virtual and hybrid sessions presented by our curator of digital research services, Doc Porter. Uh, these sessions are entitled Editing Roles in Digital MAPA, How to Model Manuscripts, a workshop on VC Editor, and Modeling the Historical Manuscript. Please also note uh, the sessions uh, at Kalamazoo co-sponsored with the research group of, on manuscript evidence that are dedicated to representations of book binding, and also the paper being presented by our SIMS-affiliated Fulbright Fellow, Zofia Zawenska, entitled uh, Form Follows Function on the Social Context of Medieval Dance. So if you're a Kalamazoo regular or will be attending for the first time, please, uh, please take note of those SIMS-related activities. Uh, finally, if you're joining us for the first time and you're curious about previous lectures in this series, you can uh, find recordings of those on the SIMS YouTube channel and in particular on the online lecture playlist. And if you're interested in receiving updates uh, on the series or on any of our other events at the Schoenberg Institute, please sign up uh, to uh, our newsletter uh, where you can find uh, monthly, you'll find more information about our other events and programs, including our fellowships, uh, but also other initiatives such as our journal manuscript studies. Uh, regarding today's lecture, I want to remind everyone that we will have a question and answer period at the end. Uh, and if you have questions that come up along the way, please uh, feel free to type them into the chat uh, and we'll uh, uh, pass those along to our speaker at the end of the talk. Uh, and of course, you're also welcome to ask questions directly. So if you do uh, want to ask your question, uh, viva voce, please, uh, use the raise hand icon and we'll call on you. I also want to remind everyone that we're recording this lecture and we will uh, put, then post it to the SIMS YouTube channel in due course. Now, finally, to our main event. Our speaker today is Andrew D. Turner, a senior research specialist at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. Dr. Turner's research focuses on art, identity, and cross-cultural interaction in ancient central Mexico, adopting a multidisciplinary viewpoint that combines methodologies from art history, archeology, span and material studies. Dr. Turner uh, received his PhD from the University of California, Riverside in 2016, with a dissertation entitled Cultures at the Crossroads, Art, Religion, and Interregional Interaction in Central Mexico, 600 to 900. And prior to arriving at the Getty, he held positions at the Yale University Art Gallery uh, and the University of Cambridge at the uh, and the University of Cambridge in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, and at the McDonald Institute for Archaeological Research. Dr. Turner has published widely on the classic Maya in the ancient Andes and edited volumes and in journals such as Ancient Mesoamerica, Archaeología Mexicana, the Yale University Art and the Yale University Art Gallery Bulletin. Most recently, he's edited an important volume on the Codite Maya de Mexico, which appeared with Getty Publications last year. The book, which is also available in Spanish and which was named one of uh, the New York Times best art books in 2022, uh, presents an in-depth exploration of the early context and the more recent debates revolving around the authenticity of the oldest surviving book 
the Americas. And this, in fact, is a topic uh, about which he will be addressing us today. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Andrew Turner. Uh, thank you very much. Um, shall I go ahead and share my screen? Okay, um, really pleased to be here uh, to talk about a um, well, a medieval manuscript from a from another um, from a tradition un unrelated to probably what what uh, what you usually talk about. Um, I'm just having some technical difficulties here. There we go. Okay. So uh, yes, today I'll be talking about Costa Maya de Mexico, uh, a book that is um, had a very controversial history. So um, basically, uh, for, for those of you who don't know, um, it's it's a, a ten page manuscript of what was probably originally twenty pages in length, and uh, it's it's had a, a very uh, complicated history. Uh, basically, it was it surfaced in the nineteen sixties, and. Uh, Oh, I'm getting these notifications to admit people in. I don't know if I should, but uh, um, let's see. Okay. Um, you can so just to the, those. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, um, what we know about the Maya bookmaking tradition is basically comes comes from three surviving books. Basically, what happened in the in the night in the in the 1560s, uh, Diego de Landa, who was um, a, a Franciscan priest in, in the Yucatan started gathering up all of the Maya books he could possibly find. And on July 12, 1562, he burned uh, at least 27 of them in public, along with supposedly about 5,000 um, sculptures, which he which he called idols. So uh, basically today what survives is, is uh, this, this is almost double the amount of pre-Hispanic uh, Mesoamerican books, including Maya, um, Nahua in Central Mexico and, and, and uh, Mixtec of Oaxaca, books that survived. We have about really about 15 pre-Hispanic books that survived. So this was just in this one event, twice, twice, almost twice the amount of books that survive uh, um, were, were destroyed. So um, th this is, of course, a, a horrible travesty and really out of out of what was hundreds or thousands of books made over, you know, probably 2000 years at least uh, or, or 1500 years. Now only three survive, and those are found in uh, collections in uh, Dresden, Madrid, and Paris. And and all of these books were probably made shortly before the arrival of the Spanish. And it's not really clear how they how they left uh, uh, Mexico, but they're probably made somewhere in, in the Yucatan Peninsula. So um, of the three books, the Codex Dresden is is probably the the finest. It's uh, suffered some damage. It suffered some damage in, uh, during World War II. But uh, um, it has uh, some really complex information about deities, uh, movements of planets, such as um, all the visible planets, such as you know Venus, but also Mercury, uh, Jupiter, Saturn, um, eclipse tables, uh, things like that. And uh, um, the Codex Madrid is the longest of the three, and it uh, deals with a lot of astronomical information, but also has um, pages on things like beekeeping and deer hunting. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting book. And the, the Codex Paris, uh, Paris is the shortest of, the, of, of these three surviving manuscripts and, and in pretty rough condition, although uh, what survives is very finely painted with a lot of, with a lot of hieroglyphs. So uh, these Mesoamerican books were made, uh, or basically we call them screen folds. So they're not bound along one edge like European books. They're basically made out of long pieces of paper that are uh, divided into sections and covered with with um, with uh, plaster, and then basically you could open the whole thing up like a like a like a screen, or fold it. You could look at one or two pages at a time, or you could you could you could look at several pages or unfold it along its entire length and look, and look at an entire side. Um, all of them, with the exception exception of the Coase Maya de Mexico, are painted on both sides or decorated on both sides. Some were decorated on one side, and then and then another artist came and, and decorated the other side later. Uh, but uh, um, Cosa Maya de Mexico, at least, is only decorated on one side. So uh, these books, the, the Central Mexican and Oaxacan books, tend to be made out of a base of uh, animal pelt or animal skin, um, deer usually, deer vellum. But uh, uh, the books are also made out of a, a paper, uh, indigenous paper called amate. So amate is still made today in a, in a town called San Pablito Pauatlan in the state of Puebla. 
But uh, this was a really widespread industry in ancient Mesoamerica. And there were a lot of different plants that people could use to make paper. Uh, one of the most important being the, the ficus or the or fig tree, but uh, mulberry, um, agave, different types of uh, cotton could, could be used to make paper as well. So uh, what's done today in San Pablito Pahuatlan is they strip out the inner bark of, of trees, they soak the, these uh, uh, fibers and then um, remove some of the, some of the um, uh, gums and toxins and then uh, basically uh, boil and then uh, take the pulp and, and basically pound it together with with a stone to make it into a paper and then, and then they dry it out. Uh, so um, these Mesoamerican manuscripts were, were then covered with a thin layer of gesso or, 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 or plaster. And you can see this is uh, from, from this uh, close up here, you can see the fibers underneath and, and that, that gesso layer is extremely, extremely exceptionally thin. So um, little wonder that uh, aside from um, you know, uh, Spaniard, zealous Spaniards collecting up all these man as many manuscripts as they could and destroying them, uh, they don't survive very well archaeologically because the, the paper itself is perishable and the, the, uh, the gesso is, is quite thin usually. So there, there have been a few um, small fragments that have been found in excavations, such as uh, um, in the 1970s in a, a site called a little known site called El Mirador Chiapas. There's basically a fused block of plaster that was found, actually two of them. Um, but but basically what, what had happened is that the, the paper had had uh, disintegrated and the, uh, the the plaster layers basically just sort of fused together into a inseparable block that will probably um, never be able to be uh, made use of in any way, shape or form. And then in the 1930s in the in the classic Maya city of Huachetun uh, in, Gu in Guatemala, some painted fragments were found, but um, and, and those have recently been, been reanalyzed by um, a couple of scholars, uh, Nicholas Carter and, and Jeffrey Dobriner, and they, they found actual impressions of paper on, on the other sides of the, 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 the pages, proving that this was once probably a, um, a, a, an old codex. These would be the oldest in, example, in existence, however, um, not much can be done with them. You certainly can't read them or anything like that. These are, these are just really fragmentary, but it, it does show that these traditions did exist. Uh, so um, in, in the absence of actual physical examples of codices, there are at least for the classic period Maya. So this, this time period from about uh, eight, uh, uh, 200 to, to 800 CE, there are a lot of examples that show uh, scribes and, and books so um, on the left, you see a, a, a drawing that I made of a, the maze god who's holding a, a half in his, um, in his left hand, he's holding a half of a conch shell that he's using as a paint palette, and he's painting a, a book. You can see the stacked pages over there on the, on the, the left side of the image. Uh, below this is a famous image of a, of, a, of a rabbit acting as a scribe in an underworld court in a, in a vessel that's now in the uh, art gallery in Princeton. And you can see that the the book uh, he's got the the scribe has the book open um, with with the the sort of the, the cover leaning off to the side and the cover is covered with jaguar pelt so that that seems to be kind of a common uh, way for the uh, classic Maya to represent a book is the the, the two covers um, uh, adorned with jaguar pelt and then the interior is something that's that's open and scribes are often shown recording information on them and then uh, we also have a style of vessels that that's called the codex style that's uh, typically painted with a orange or red uh, rim and, and base, and then uh, just uh, simply cream background and, and, uh, and uh, black pigment, usually with maybe with some fine washes. This, this black and white style um, is, is really kind of what we come to expect from, from a Mesoamerican codex. So this is, in fact, for the, for the Aztecs, they, they had a term called intlilia intlapali, which actually meant the black and the red, and those two terms together signify writing so so writing is called the black and the red for the for the aztecs undoubtedly referring to this tradition of of um of recording uh, imagery in in uh, in books but uh, um unfortunately for this period no, nothing really survives in terms of actual codices though we do have ample evidence of, of um uh, people shown as scribes painting books and 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 holding them in in, in courts so with uh, the three well-known examples uh Virtually um, up until the 1970s, um, virtually everything that was known about Maya hieroglyphic writing, Maya astronomy, Maya mathematics, Maya deities, all came from study of those of those three books, uh, especially the Codex Dresden. 
And uh, these, these books were um, um, considered extremely important, and extremely rare. And then in uh, 1971, another codex just happened to surface in a, in a small exhibition in New York City called uh, Ancient Maya Calligraphy that was curated by Michael Coe, a scholar at Yale. So uh, Michael Coe had heard that there was a, a codex in a private collection in Mexico City. He'd seen photos of it, and it was basically in New York in the process of being sold when he managed to get it for an exhibition that he was putting together that really was supposed to highlight the uh, calligraphy, calligraphic writing on, on Maya pottery. So um, nobody had really seen this codex before, maybe just a handful of people, and it, uh, all of a sudden a, a, a purported fourth codex shows up in, in this exhibition. Uh, so um, you can imagine this, this caused a bit of a stir. So uh, according to the story, the, the codex was owned by um, a man named Josue Sáenz, who was the, uh, uh, I, I guess, most famous for being the head of the um, 1968 Mexico City Olympics planning committee. But he was a big collector of pre-Hispanic art. And uh, the story that he gave was that, uh, well, he, he gave a couple of stories. The first story that he gave was that uh, some people contacted him about a, an important cache of objects that, that he as a prominent collector would be interested in. Uh, they they flew him in a Cessna to uh, um, some, somewhere in the jungle of, of um, he, he claimed he knew the terrain well enough to know that he was maybe in the northern part of the state of Chiapas or the southern part of the state of Tabasco. And people showed him this collection of objects. And, and, and um, these were, were really interesting objects because they were otherwise perishable. So they, they were claimed to have been found in a cave. So um, the, the book was among them. There were some wooden boxes, a, a dagger with a wooden handle, a couple of wooden masks. They were all claimed to have been found from this cave. He, uh, he couldn't make the decision to buy them on the spot. So he, um, he took them back to Mexico City to have them authenticated. Uh, me meanwhile, uh, his, uh, his primary authenticator did not like the objects at all one bit. So, so um, the authenticator, uh, Jose Luis Franco, thought that they were, thought that they were all fakes. So, um, but he basically ended up being stuck with these objects. So he was basically in the process of un unloading them when, when Michael Coe uh, got the codex for the, for the exhibition. So th this is kind of an interesting codex because it's, it's not really from the place that uh, the other three were from, and it doesn't really look exactly like the others. So uh, when, when Michael Coe put this uh, uh, codex in the exhibition, only about 2,000 people went to the, the exhibition uh, that was held in 1971 at the Grolier Club in New York. So for those of you who don't know, that's a, kind of a, a, a bibliophiles club in, in New York City. So um, he shows this, this, uh, this codex on display, and uh, there, there's a, um, a newspaper article that comes out in the New York Times where uh, uh, Michael Coe refers to it as a real hot potato. So he, he says that um, he, he knows that uh, his colleagues are, are not going to um, believe this, but he's willing to stake his entire reputation on its authenticity. Uh, a couple of other prominent scholars were asked to comment on it, Tatiana Proskuryakov, Gordon Ekholm, um, two, two really prominent Mesoamerican scholars, and they basically declined to comment on it. They said, we can't really comment on its authenticity until it's, it's really um, carefully examined, but, but um, people should be skeptical of something like this. So, so that was all fine and good until 1973 when uh, Michael Coe published basically an exhibition catalog uh, for, for the Grolier Show uh, called The Maya Scribe and His World. So not only did it include rollout drawings and, and photographs of, of the, the vessels that he showed in the exhibition, but it also um, uh, contained a, a full facsimile of the um, of what what they were what was then known as the Grolier Codex. So this this codex in question, which was considered to be eleven pages at the time, and then and there were a couple of other scraps of blank paper. Well, th this is basically what tips off the large controversy in uh, 1975. Uh, Sir J. Eric S. Thompson, who was the kind of the leading scholar of the Maya for the for most of the 20th century, writes a, a, a damning critique of of the uh, of of um, Coe's authentic, uh, authentication of the Codex. He basically argues that it's a it's a fake Codex. Um, anybody anybody uh, could, could spot it as such. There are a lot of problems with it, according to Thompson. It's um, it's it's a little bit too glossy to 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 be comparable to the other two. The other three, it doesn't look like the other three. And um, crucially, Michael Coe had had 
uh, radiocarbon dating uh, done on, on a sample from, from the uh, Grolier Codex. And it came back to be uh, uh, several hundred years old, so maybe maybe seven seven or eight hundred years old, something like that. Well, uh, Thompson's response to this was that um, forgers are basically sitting on large uh, stacks of, of uh, pre-Hispanic paper that have been found in caves, and these clever forgers basically make make facsimiles on top of on top of this ancient paper in order to to fool uh, modern buyers who are you know going to try to date them somehow. So basically the 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 two the the big um debate between these two well Thompson basically dies the year it's published but uh th this this um kind of um standoff between these two very prominent scholars kicks off several decades of debate about the authenticity of of what was then called the Grolier Codex that wasn't really resolved until recently and and in fact it was largely considered uh, i think just so something that was just um too problematic to deal with by most people so uh, over in the intervening decades, there, there were a few studies on either side. One of the prominent uh, um, 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 uh, scholars that argued for its authenticity was, was uh, John Carlson, along with George Stewart of the National Geographic Society, who, uh, uh, and uh, Carlson published a couple of important studies in the, well, um, over its authenticity, uh, basically taking, taking um, uh, Michael Coe's side. Uh, so some of the some of the good evidence for its uh, authenticity was um, there's a uh, the, the codex is mostly in uh, colors of red and black on on white gesso, but uh, uh, there is one little spot of blue pigment, and uh, uh, it was long argued that this was actually a color called Maya blue. So this um, Maya blue is extremely uh, it's it's really distinct to Mesoamerican artwork, and it and it hasn't been produced in, since like the you know 16th or 17th century. Uh, Maya blue is a really distinctive pigment that's that's basically made from a particular type of clay that's found in Yucatan that's cooked in a certain way uh, with with uh, indigo flowers, such that a, as it's cooked at the proper temperature, the um, color molecules from the from the indigo flowers basically find their way into these hollow um, tube-like microstructures of the palagorskite clay, and it makes this a really really durable. Um, uh, almost permanent blue color that uh, um, that uh, Mesoamerican peoples used. It was considered precious and only only used in small um, quantities here in the Codex, but uh, but nonetheless, it was something that uh, modern uh, uh, scholars and forgers weren't able to replicate until the 1980s. So this was a, a good piece of evidence that the 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 um, the Grolier Codex, um, which was you know found in the mid 1960s, was real because nobody could could really authentic could really um, could really replicate this this color Maya blue, and the, the the problem was is there was no real way to ascertain that it was in fact Maya blue. You could only say that it um, you could only you could only test it in certain ways that were destructive uh, that Maya blue would actually resist. So it resists bleach, it resists uh, acid, it resists a, a battery of tests. But it, you know there wasn't really a way to, to determine positively that it was Maya blue. You could you could possibly narrow it down if if, if acid would damage it, then you could say it wasn't Maya blue. But uh, but basically like every single test was destructive and, and would require destroying a small portion of this of this fragment that survives. Uh, in 2015, Michael Coe, along with his uh, former students, Stephen Houston, Mary Miller, and Carl Tauba, published, uh, made kind of one, one final push. Michael Coe was approaching 90 at this point. He wanted to make one, one final push that argued for the authenticity of the codex, which had basically Sat in the vault of the the Museo Nacional de Antropología in Mexico City for for several decades at this point, and, and very few people had access to it. And crucially, I think uh, most of the people who argued against its authenticity had never actually seen it in person. So very very few people actually examined the codex in person. So um, you know, Co and his colleague Floyd Lounsbury, who was the um, expert in archaeoastronomy at the time, um, they examined it uh, when, when it was in in New York. Um, uh, um, uh, George Stewart and John Carlson uh, visited in the in the, in the uh, vault in Mexico City, and uh, Mary Miller later visited it along with um, Baltasar Brito, the director of the um, National Library of Anthropology in Mexico City. So um, Co and his former students put together this article that basically um, collected all of the, the 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 previous arguments for the authenticity of this codex and. Um, 
structure uh, and, and along with some new pieces of evidence one uh being uh, one of um one of the critiques before was that if you look very closely at at the pages there's some red underpainting uh, that you, that you can see what we i guess we'd call in in uh, the Renaissance pincementi, uh, um, where the the uh, initial sketches were done in red, and then um, either the same artist or another artist later came along and 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 inked everything in with with black pigment. Um, th this was considered um, uh, evidence to the contrary for its authenticity. However, um, this uh, study by Cohen colleagues noted that there is that that it's actually in. Maya mural painting, it's actually quite common to see this red underpainting with with uh, with the black final version later, such as this example at Chichen Itza, and they show up at the in the famous murals of, of Bonampak from the classic period as well. Um, but but largely the argument their arguments were structured around uh, things that uh, show up in the the Grolier Codex, uh, which couldn't have been known at the time that the that the manuscript was uh, supposedly forged so maya blue was one one thing that basically couldn't couldn't have been replicated but there were other things like this this deity that has this uh these big curling volutes on the sides of its head um th this is now known to be a mountain deity uh and and um it was basically unknown in the 1960s and uh the example that you see on the left from tanka was found in the mid 70s so um this is something that the forger would have had to have been really kind of um Kind of prescient in order to figure out they would have had to um understand the Clindrix, they would have had to understand my astronomy they would have had to have a, a deep understanding of my deities and they would have had to have supposedly according to um thompson big collections of pre-hispanic paper and they would have had to have had the skill to to pull it all off and make a believable uh, a believable um um forgery so uh the publication of this article prompted uh, Baltasar Brito, the, the director of the National Library of Anthropology in Mexico City, to put together a study. And um, basically, uh, using the same set of arguments uh, for, for several years, it basically um, just gotten people nowhere, and, and both sides were kind of entrenched in their own in their own ways of, um, it, it, seemed, it seemed it was impossible to convince people at this point who didn't believe in the codex's authenticity that it was in fact a real an authentic manuscript so um brito put together several teams of independent scholars from mostly from mexico's uh, instituto nacional de antropología e historia and uh he he gathered uh, various experts that could address different aspects of the the codices in authenticity or inauthenticity uh, uh who and crucially none of these scholars had uh, a, a dog in the race basically so 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 basically um and and they didn't they weren't supposed to interact with each other at all so he got together uh people who were experts in um ancient paper use and manufacture people who were um uh, uh experts on on uh, insects there were insects insect remains found in, in the codex people who were uh, experts on astronomy and iconography and um People who are experts on various types of destructive and non-destructive uh, um, uh, analysis of, of ancient books. So uh, uh, one of one of the people who worked a lot on this codex was um, Gerardo Gutierrez, who's a who's a, a anthropology professor at uh, CU Boulder. He did a, a number of um, he did a number of uh, uh, mostly non-destructive um, tests to determine the authenticity of the of the Costa Maya de Mexico. So and, and the, the the results of this of these studies were published in 2018. So um, they they did things like ultraviolet fluorescence, and basically they were looking for any sort of trace of uh, any sort of modern material in this in the in the codex, some anything that was not consistent with it being made uh, around uh, eight or nine hundred years ago. So um, under this uh, UV fluorescence, you can see the darker patches uh, seem to seem to indicate. Uh, some sort of a uh, um, 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 uh, uh, basically dripping of, of some sort of material that might be consistent with it being found in a cave uh, under a gold fashioned raking light you can see um, what was determined to be insect damage all over the the lower portion of of, uh, of page nine and then there were some other more sophisticated uh, um, techniques such as um, uh, the use of portable x-ray fluorescence xrf 
to determine basically um, what types of constituent elements uh, uh, various samples of the, of the codex were made of. So they, basically, um, there, there was nothing that was out of out of sync with this being an ancient book. Um, there were no modern materials other than some some uh, spray that a uh, um, a conservator sprayed on it in New York City in 1970 or 71, and uh, um, and some some really other interesting things came to light. It was made out of uh, the the paper itself was made out of uh, the inner bark of a fig tree, and uh, um, oddly enough, it didn't show any signs of crushing. It was basically like thin layers of 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 uh, the inner bark of a fig tree laid like three plies laid uh, with alternating grain pattern in order to give the, the book more tensile strength. There were two types of red. Uh, one, one red was uh, iron ore hematite, and the other one was cochineal, which is a, which is a, um, derived from an insect that feeds on Nepal cactus. Um, the Maya blue is is, is uh, palagorskite clay, and, and, and basically um, uh, it had been munched on by insects that uh, were consistent with um, those who that you might find in a cave or along with a burial or something like that. So so basically everything pointed to this being an authentic manuscript. And um, radiocarbon dating has come a long way since the 1970s and, and basically with uh, um, accelerated mass spectrometer carbon dating, a smaller sample can yield more, more accurate results. And they took several more um, samples radio, for radiocarbon dating and, and basically they came back that, that this, it, it appears that this manuscript was made around uh, the year 1100, some, sometime around then. Uh, stylistically, it seems like it, uh, quite likely that it could come from the, the region in question where, where um, Josue Science claimed it was from. Uh, he basically, af after, the, after the exhibition, he got in trouble uh, uh, for exporting an object from Mexico that may or may not have been authentic. And uh, it caused him to lose his, uh, his uh, standing in Mexico City, uh, in, in Mexico somewhat, his governmental standing. And um, he ended up changing his story and he claimed that it was um, given to him, it was hidden within the pages of another book that was given to him by a friend. And neither of them knew that it was in there, it just sort of appeared. So, um, but it seems like the first story, the, the, the one that actually seems more far-fetched, about the trip to the jungle might actually, it's, though, it's, though it has some problems, it might actually be the, the, the more authentic uh, of the two stories. And it seems like it, the, the, the manuscript could well have come from this area. So one, one of the major uh, critiques of Thompson and, and other people who thought that the codex was a fake was that uh, um, it just doesn't look like the other three codices. Well, um, I think when you've got a sample of, of three it's hard to toss out a fourth one when it doesn't look like when it when it doesn't look like the others. And uh, um, furthermore, there's reasons for that. It doesn't seem to have been made in the same region or the same time period. So the other three codices were were probably made at least 200 years uh, later. And uh, during at least when the um, when the uh, radio car the the time when the radio car that the radio carbon dates indicate the two major cities in Mesoamerica were were Tula and the state of Hidalgo. And Chichen Itza, the um, in the in the modern state of Yucatan, these are part of what we call the uh, is often called the Toltec tradition. And uh, basically, the area where the Cosima, uh, so so I, I should also back up and say at this point, um, the Codex was acknowledged after the 2018 publication and conference as being authentic, and the name was changed from Golia Codex to Codice Maya de Mexico, which basically um, reflects the the makers of the Codex, the Maya and the current location where it is, Mexico. So, so this is more consistent with the naming of the other codices. And this is in fact the only, only um, Maya codex that is, is uh, still in its, its uh, retained by its country of origin. So it's, it's the only one that's now held in Mexico. The other three, of course, as I mentioned before, are found in Europe. So, um, so the Codice Maya de Mexico at this point is now considered to, to, uh, to be authentic, dating to about uh, um, 1100 or so. Um, it seems quite likely that it could come from the place that, that science said it came from, and it seems quite likely that it could have come from a cave or a tomb or something like that. Uh, certainly the fact that it's so well preserved um, suggests that it had to have been preserved under some exceptional circumstances, because otherwise otherwise um, the paper and, and plaster would, would not have survived in the state that it survives. 
Uh, and in, just in, in terms of iconography and imagery, it, it does seem to draw on um, important stylistic trends that happen at both Tula and Chichen Itza. So, so the, it seems to work pretty well uh, visually with, with those two other, other cities. And this is something that Michael Coe also, also understood. Um, although the, the problem is we really don't know much about this area in this particular time period. So it's, it's um, you know, just one of the few objects that we'd have uh, from this time period. There's been some survey work done in that area, but no, not, um, not a lot of um, excavation major sites or anything like that. It's near um, city, important earlier cities such as Palenque, but uh, um, don't really uh, know much about this, this uh, time, this place in this particular time period. So it's a, so it's a really interesting manuscript because it sheds light on a kind of an interesting tradition that otherwise might've been considered lost. So um, what is the codex and what does it do? Well, it's basically an almanac. It's 10 pages of probably what was originally 20 pages um, of, a, of a book that predicted the movements of the planet Venus over a period of 104 years. So uh, pr pretty remarkable that it could be done. It's, it's got, it's, it's not recording, it's, it's, it's predictive. And this is actually pretty consistent with, with the other Maya codices uh, in terms of their astronomical content. The Central Mexican codices are also um, somewhat astronomical, ritual uh, in content. Mishtec codices tend to be historical and genealogical. So there's there's um, you know a lot of uses for Mesoamerican books. Certainly among all of the traditions that we know of that produced uh, books, there was probably a lot of variation. For the Maya, we only have these four, and they they tend to tend to focus a lot on on astronomical material. So um, basically. The pages uh, follow some some formulae that are pretty easy to break down, uh, really, when you look at it. So there's we we don't know how many artists worked on these pages, but they they did follow a scheme that's consistent on all all ten surviving pages. So over on the left, there's a column of dates, and these these dates are a combination between bars and dots and these uh, symbols within cartouches that uh, are from the the Mesoamerican 260 day calendar. There's a uh, bundled uh, with some additional dates inside of it that um, the scholars have called a ring number. Th those are all found in the upper middle of, of each page. There's a deity that dominates the right side of the page and is, is always uh, facing toward the left side of the page. And that deity is usually um, confronting, restraining, uh, attacking, sacrificing a victim that's shown in, in, the, in the left or lower left. And this is actually um, pretty consistent with the the Venus pages of the Codex Dresden. So the so the Maya Codex that's a couple of hundred years older than this one probably. It shows uh, in an upper register. This is these aren't the entire pages. These are just selections of the pages. But in the upper portion, it shows there are five different deities, each related to Venus as the morning star, that are uh, holding spears and other weapons, and they seem to be attacking, launching darts at. Uh, Victims that are in those lower registers that include, um, you know, there's a deer, there's a, a, a couple of deities, um, a, a supernatural frog or turtle. Um, so uh, I'll just back up a little bit. My goal here is to have you be able to read this this codex pretty easily and, and appreciate its content uh, within the course of about 30 minutes or so. So I, I think the, the the knowledge that went into producing this codex is is extremely is immense and extremely complicated, but actually being able to read and, and use the codex is, is fairly simple. So uh, for those of you who don't know how to read uh, Maya numbers, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautifully graphic system that can be learned in, in, in the course of about five seconds. So um, a, a dot equals uh, has a value of one, a bar has a value of five. So any combination such as two dots and a bar is number seven, uh, three dots, two bars would be 13, et cetera, et cetera, can, can be easily read just uh, visually like that. So, um, and you won't really see a number larger than 19 because um, the, the it's uh, Maya used a, a base 20 system that was uh, had held place values. So, so basically, um, um, concept of zero was known for for the for the ancient Maya. Uh, um, you don't see any zeros in this particular book, but you can you can basically read all the numbers one through um, 13 that will appear uh, in the book, or, or one through 19, basically. Uh, the the 260 day calendar I mentioned before is a combination of these numbers along with one of 20 possible day signs. So um, the, these these um, 13 numbers and 20 day signs cycled through uh, in um, in a in particular order 
uh, over the course of 260 days. Uh, why is 260 days such an important time period? Well, there's there's several reasons that people speculated. One is that um, 260 days is basically the length of human gestation. So uh, we consider it nine months, but it's also about 260 days. So basically, um, in, in central Mexico, for example, at the time of Spanish contact, people were often named after the day that they were born. And they were also, by extension, named after the day that they were conceived. So this is a really important day in your life when you're both conceived and, and born in this in this calendar. And uh, on top of that are, are a bunch of prophecies that are associated with particular with births on, on particular days. So so your your destiny, your fate as a person is really intricately tied to your your birthday in this in this system. So the system is really, really used a lot for prophecy. Mesoamerican peoples did also recognize the 365 day um calendar as well, which worked in tandem with, with this 260 day, but 260 day calendar is really the root of prophecy. Uh, it, it's uh, 260 days is also uh, roughly the time it takes to plant a, um, the, the staple crop of Mesoamerica, maize, uh, from a seed to harvest. So that, that's another possible reason. And then on top of that, it might, might also relate to um, the length of certain phases within the Venus cycle itself, which I'll get into a little bit later. So 260 days seems a little crazy as a, as a time period for us who aren't used to thinking about it. And also having a combination of 13 days and, and 20 day signs also seems a little bit difficult to grasp if you're not um, deeply immersed in the system. But it's actually not so different from how we, we reckon time in our calendar. So um, instead of having 20 uh, days, the day, uh, named days, we have seven named days, Sunday through, through, um, through Saturday. And then um, instead of 13 numbers, we have a var variation of 28 to 31 numbers. So you know that regardless of the month, uh, Wednesday the 12th will be followed by Thursday the 13th, um, Friday the 14th, et cetera, et cetera. This is, this is basically how um, the, 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 the day sign and number um, cycle happens in, in Mesoamerican numbers as well in, Meso in the 260-day calendar. And then you know that at the end of the month, the last day might be Sunday the 30th, but you know that though the month might change, the numbers will start again um, and, and the, the days of the, the week will remain consistent. So you know that after Sunday the 30th uh, this month, Monday will be the first, Tuesday will be the second of, of May. So as, as we look at um, all of the days of the 260 day calendar here, this is basically how it works. The, the first day of the calendar would be uh, one, and, and uh, co combined with the, the first day sign Imish. The second would be two ik, three akbal. Get the basic idea, we can skip a few, four khan, five chikchan, et cetera. And we don't really run into any problems till we get to 13 ben, which is, we're, we're now at our um, uh, thir 13 numbers, but uh, um, we, we um, our day signs continue, but we have to, we cycle back to one at this point. So the 14th day sign is actually uh, ish, but we go back to number one. So this is this is the end of a first uh, 13 day cycle. So then after this, we have um, six more numbers, uh, uh, sorry, six more day signs, but we, we come to uh, a how, which is the last of our uh, uh, day signs in, in our, our 20 day uh, cycle. So um, we cycle back to the first day sign after that, but our numbers keep going. So after seven, a how is eight emish. And this basically uh, cycles through all the way until you get to the last day of the 260 day calendar, which would be two, uh, 13 a how, and then we go back to 13 emish after that, after a full 260 day cycle has gone through. So uh, how does this relate to Venus and why is Venus so important? So uh, it, it, I guess uh, as um, those of us who are sort of steeped in, and based in the European tradition, we have to sort of forget all that stuff about Venus being related to uh, um, erotic love and all those things. It has absolutely nothing to do with that in Mesoamerica. Venus is kind of a, a, a terrifying apparition and it's, it's, its first appearance in different phases is linked to dangerous prophecies in Mesoamerica. So uh, why is Venus so important? Well, um, aside from the sun and moon, it's, it's the brightest thing in the sky when it appears. It's, it's not visible all the time. It's got an extremely complex cycle that's difficult to predict if, if you don't know what to expect. Um, but for Mesoamerican peoples, the 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 um, the lore around v the planet Venus is is really rich. For Central Mexico, there's a deity called Tlahuitzcalpantecutli, whose name means Lord of the House of Dawn, and uh, he's he's a terrifying deity that basically um, when when um, 
Morningstar makes its first appearance um, is shown uh, um, spearing and attacking different uh, different things. He's he's always either chasing the sun or being chased by the sun, and and he's considered kind of a um, um, frightful being that's associated with dangerous prophecies such as drought and uh, um, um, deformities in children and, and thing, things like that. So it's, it's kind of a, a scary being for for um, Mesoamerican peoples. Uh, so um, Venus actually has a really hard uh, cycle to predict. So Venus appears, as, as we know, sometimes as morning star, sometimes as evening star. It disappears for other times. Most ancient traditions saw Venus, the morning star, and Venus, the evening star, as two separate celestial bodies. So the um, classic Greeks, for example, didn't didn't think that it was that, that morning star and evening star were the same thing. They they saw them as as sort of a paired. Um, objects, but not necessarily the same the same celestial body. Mesoamerican peoples and uh, ancient Mesopotamia peoples are, I think, as, as far as I know, unique in the world in recognizing that morning star and evening star are actually the same celestial phenomenon, that Venus is, is one, one celestial body that just has an extremely complex um, pattern of movements that's difficult to discern, especially without, uh, without modern instruments. So, so basically, the reason for this is Venus has this kind of difficult to predict cycle because, um, from an astronomical standpoint, Venus's orbit around the sun is in, encompassed within our uh, orbit around the sun. So, Venus will take 225 days to go around the sun, whereas Earth takes 365, or you know, more specifically, 365.24 days to go around the sun. So, uh, we're moving at different speeds, basically. So, so um, from the perspective of Earth. This is why uh, Venus um, doesn't always appear in the same place all the time because it's it's basically moving around the sun at a slightly faster pace within our own orbit. So uh, the Maya and other Mesoamerican peoples recognize that Venus won't appear to the same at the same spot in in the in the um, night sky for 584 days. Uh, take, so basically, like a full Venus cycle from the perspective of Earth takes 584 days. Uh, um, according to Mesoamerican peoples. According to modern calculations, it takes an average of 583.92 days. So they were really sort of only off by 0 0.08 days, which is pretty remarkable, a pretty remarkable set of observation. And perhaps it wasn't even um, an estimate consider, considering that they didn't use decimals. So they, they basically just rounded. Um, but but uh, um, that 0 0.08 days, just like the 0.24 days in our leap year, catches up with Venus calendars after a little while, and, and things have to be recalibrated every now and then. So how does this Venus cycle work? So um, Venus, as I mentioned, is, is moving at a, at, a, at a faster rate around the sun than the Earth is. And to make things slightly more complicated, the Earth itself is rotating on its, on its daily axis. So um, for a while, uh, for a period of, according to Mesoamerican peoples, 300, 236 days, Venus will appear in the morning as the morning star. Um, for us, that takes an average of 263 days. So um, Maya and other Mesoamerican peoples played with the numbers a little bit because they were interested in harmonizing different, different celestial phenomena. But basically, um, if you get up in the morning during morning star phase before the sunrise, you'll see Venus very prominently in the sky ahead of, ahead of the sun. And then as the sun rises, it'll, it'll um, gradually disappear. So this is basically sort of what it looks like. You can see the moon and then sun is just coming over the horizon there at, uh, during the morning. And this is a, um, a very, very complex and sophisticated graphic I made that shows how this phenomena basically sort of looks from, from, from our perspective on Earth as, as morning star rises. So um, I've made the sun look kind of like kind of like Saturn there with, with uh, to show the orbit of Venus going around the sun itself so that you can see from our perspective, Venus is always basically tethered to the sun as, it, as it's going around it. So because its orbit is within our orbit, we always see Venus in very close proximity to the sun, either seemingly leading it out of out of the horizon in the morning or or seemingly following it into the horizon at, uh, at dusk. So after the morning star phase, Venus then travels behind the sun from our perspective. For uh, the Mesoamerican, for Mesoamerican peoples, this this period lasts ninety days. Uh, for us, it usually lasts an average of fifty days of observed disappearance of Venus. We can't see it because it's basically being blocked by the sun as it's as it's traveling around that that portion of 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 the sun's orbit. So this 
Um, I didn't really have a, a great way of animating this, but that's basically, you can't see Venus at this point because it's behind the sun from our perspective. It reemerges uh, at, at the end of this period as, as evening star. So for Mesoamerican peoples, this is 250 days. For us, this is an average of 263 days. And it travels around, it's basically on, on, on the other uh, branch of its, of its orbit around the sun. We see it uh, in the evening, and that, that's basically the phase that we're in right now. Um, we're, we're actually um, kind of right, almost smack dab in the middle of, of uh, the of evening star phase. And if, if you uh, look out in the evening on a, on a clear night, up maybe 30, 40 minutes after the sun, well, actually up to like four or five hours, I think you can still see Venus after, after the sun sets because it's sort of its maximum elongation right now um, in, in its uh, orbit around the sun. It's, it's the farthest from the sun um, as far as our perspective goes. So this is basically what it looks like. So sun sets, Venus seems to follow it down into, into the horizon um, when Venus is in its evening star phase. And again, it's the it's the brightest, it's it's pretty much the first star to appear at this point, and it's the brightest thing in the night sky other than the moon. And then for a period of eight days, uh, we agree with Mesoamerican peoples on this, the Venus disappears from view as it passes between the sun and the earth. So, so basically what happens is that the sun's light is bright enough to where it makes it, makes it impossible for us to see Venus without, without, without modern instruments. But this is basically what it, what's really happening. You have Venus transiting across the, the surface of the sun. This takes about eight days from our perspective. Um, and then it reemerges again as, as, uh, as morning star. So those are the four phases of, of, of Venus that both we and Mesoamerican peoples recognize. Uh, uh, morning star visibility phase, superior conjunction and inferior conjunction and visibility phases, and the evening star visibility phase. Um, what's curious is, is, is the discrepancies between um, Mesoamerican uh, lengths of phases and, and our observed lengths of phases. But it seems that basically um, this probably has a lot to do with sinking um, these Venus phases to uh, to lo lunar cycles. So I, I think that the best example of that is probably um, a superior conjunction for us is 50 days. For Mesoamerican peoples, it's 90 days, which is basically three three lunar cycles. So it seems it seems like for for Mesoamerican peoples, I think one one thing that's interesting is they they did take really really accurate um, observations of of um, celestial phenomena, but they they weren't really necessarily interested in you know, uh, finding the numbers exactly to a T, they were interested in finding out how all these different cycles that they observed work together to make these 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 grander and grander cycles, and how uh, humans in the 260 day cycle is really in the middle of that, and that that sort of like explodes out to all these these grand um, cycles that seem to be what makes the the universe um, uh, move and function. But nonetheless. Uh, anybody who was familiar with the 260-day uh, calendar could very easily um, uh, uh, calculate the actual um, last appearance of, of, uh, of morning star or first appearance of evening star simply by taking that uh, um, taking that that uh, eight eight days and uh, um, of disappearance at inferior conjunction and counting back 260 days plus three or counting forward 260 days plus three. Um, it, it's uh, pretty simple to, to find that out. So this book predicted the movements of, of Venus over uh, through its four phases over the course of 104 years. So um, how did it do that? Well, um, well, for, first of all, uh, it works for 104 years because that uh, 0.08 days starts to become noticeable after about 104 years. Venus isn't really doing what it should be doing at that point. So so Venus cycle really lasts well for 104 years and then then basically has to be recalibrated after that. Uh, just like if, if you weren't using um, leap year, you, you'd know that after a while that uh, things just weren't happening when they were supposed to happen. It would take a little while to notice, but you, you would notice. Uh, so, so basically you have this... Um, column of glyphs from the 260-day the calendar, and then you have what was called the ring number up in the center of the page. So this is really, um, ring number is kind of an unfortunate term because it's really like a, a bundle with a knot at the top. It's like a bundle that's tied off and it has numbers inside of it. Basically how this ring number works is you take and you count um, the, the number within the bundle individually, so 10 in this case, and then you have uh, dots outside of the number 
of the bundle that are counted as, as 20s. Those have values of 20. This is something that uh, um, Michael Coe worked out with his colleague Floyd Lounsbury, who was then you know, pretty much the, the foremost expert of, of uh, Mayo astronomy, his colleague at Yale um, in the 1970s. Um, Coe, Coe himself, I think, didn't have the ability to, to evaluate the astronomy the, the way that Lounsbury did, but Lounsbury basically saw that this was a functional Venus table and that you would use these ring numbers to, to count forward to the next phases of the Venus cycle. So, um, but but nonetheless, uh, J. Eric S. Thompson had a huge problem with these ring numbers, and this was something that he claimed as as, as sort of evidence for the, uh, its authenticity. Um, perhaps he could have known better. They do appear in the Codex Dresden as well, and he actually wrote a a, a, a a major study on the Codex Dresden. So he was aware of these numbers. He just wasn't aware of their use in this in this particular way. So for him, he thought that probably somebody had just like looked at the Dresden and copied these ring numbers without really um, knowing how to use them. But it turns out turns out they were a little bit more dynamic than than, than Thompson knew. And uh, in fact, since since then as well. Yet earlier ring numbers have been discovered in murals at the classic Maya site of Shultun. So, so we have more recent and older examples of these ring numbers that appear right here in, in Costa Maya de Mexico. And these numbers actually are, um, they don't really appear on classic Maya monuments much, but um, they do function similarly to how numbers are represented in, in classic Maya monuments. So I mentioned earlier briefly that uh, the Maya use uh, pl place values for calculating periods of time um, or quantities. And uh, this is actually really consistent with how those ring numbers are shown with single numbers counted in individually within the bundles and then uh, numbers outside of the bundle counted as values of 20. So um, within uh, Maya, classic Maya date inscriptions, single numbers are called keens and they're counted individually. And then there's the next value up is a period of 20 days, which is uh, called wienals that are that are counted basically as in this example would be like nine times 20, 180. So you'd read this period of time here as um, nine wienals and two keens is basically 182 days when you when you calculate all that together. So basically the same way that, that the uh, that the ring numbers work, they basically act as a um, wienals outside of the bundle and keens within the within the bundle. And you calculate those numbers together and count use those uh, to, to jump forward to the next page. So if you're reading this um, this book, you might start with the uh, upper left date um, in the upper upper corner of, of the manuscript. You'd count forward 10 plus 80 days or 90 days. That would tell you that you're looking at the page that has to do with that superior conjunction phase that lasts 90 days, and that would uh, right. So when 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 um, Venus disappears behind the sun, and then that takes you to the next page, uh, which will tell you when the next uh, the date where the next phase begins. So um, so move, moving forward from that uh, initial date, uh, um, I basically put. If you look at this page, uh, page four, we have um, we have what uh, sixteen numbers within within the bundle, and then we have there's some missing eleven dots outside of the bundle. So um, if we calculate all that up, that's two hundred thirty six days, and that tells us we're looking at the morning star phase, right? So um, if you uh, I've, I've basically taken a portion of this cal uh, calendar and, and shown, you know, the, the values of 20 plus the partial date, and that basically that takes us from the starting date of 11 ebb, and if you count forward 236 days, that gets us to um, 13 Lamat, which is in fact the first the first uh, first number on the upper left of, of of page five. So what we've done is we basically started with this uh, 11. 11 ebb date, we've counted forward 236 days, and we've arrived at 13 Lamas. So this is basically how you read this from page to page to page as, as you go through. Um, looking at this next page, page five, the ring number is four dots outside of the bundle um, and, and a number 10 inside of the bundle. So we have basically uh, four times 20 plus 10, which is 90. Um, if we start at our date of 13 Lamas, uh, add 90 days, we, uh, which is our superior conjunction and visibility phase, that ends us up at um, 12 at snob on the next page. So, so pretty easy to read through these dates when, when you get the hang of using this cal uh, calendar. Um, page six, 
12 dots outside of the bundle times 20 plus uh, plus 10 inside of the bundle, which adds up to 250 days, which is our evening star phase, right? So so this is a page that, that deals with uh, Venus's evening star. Uh, we count forward and that puts us at the day to Lamat, which is on, on page seven. So um, we're moving through uh, in, in this way. Um, so uh, we, we start at Tula Mat on, on page seven. And we count forward eight days, which is basically our period of inferior conjunction and visibility as, as Venus is transiting across the, the surface of the sun. And that puts us eight days later at the date 10 keep, which is the, the starting date on 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 um, on page eight. So basically, I've, I've taken you through the, the first dates on the set of four pages. We have uh, 10 pages. We, we know basically originally this this book would have held would have would have con consisted of, of 20 pages uh, with 13 columns each. This uh, takes us through a, a period of 104 years, which is basically um, 65 Venus cycles. Um, Venus cycles and solar years uh, add up in, in pretty interesting ways because basically five Venus cycles is equal to, to eight solar years. So as, so as you read through, you basically sort of read through, um, you know, line by line, page by page, it, it gets you through 104 years of, of uh, Venus cycles. So um, Cusimaya Maya de Mexico tells us some, some pretty interesting things about uh, um, Venus and how it's conceived for, for the Maya and other Mesoamerican peoples. So as I mentioned before, um, Tlahuiscalpantecutli for, for Central Mexico uh, is associated with um, certain predictions. So, so um, th we have in the Codex Borgia, which was made in Central Mexico sometime prior to the arrival of, of the Spanish, uh, a set of prophecies that seem to be linked to the, the appearance of Tlahuitzcalpantecutli um, on certain dates. And this is the appearance of, of Venus as morning star. So it's typically been considered that uh, Venus as morning star, the first appearance of morning star is the really the really dangerous point in the, in the Venus cycle. So um, so this, this uh, set of pages that we call the Venus tables in the Codex Borgia on pages 53 and 54 have um, five of these blocks that show uh, Venus appearing with certain dates performing certain actions. So he's um, spearing a victim. And this is not, not so different from um, the Codex Dresden, where you have these deities in the upper register who are aiming darts at, at these victims that are in the lower register that are in fact speared and dying and, and um, spouting gouts of blood. So um, here's how these prophecies work. So, so uh, in, in the example on the left, you can see uh, Venus appearing on certain dates. He's uh, spearing the maize god in the in the foot. This is this is the central Mexican maize deity Sinteotl, and he's being speared. So this this probably suggests some sort of trouble with crops or something like that. With like that, the example on the right shows him spearing another deity. Uh, in this example, it's the deity Tezcatlipoca, who's sitting on top of this cleft mountain with with water gushing out of it. A little little hard to determine what that means exactly, but uh, the the other examples are a little more clear. So um, here on the left, uh, Tlahuitzcalpantecutli is uh, spearing a person who's sitting on a throne. So this maybe suggests that there might be some sort of issue with, with uh, rulership um, when Venus appears as morning star on, on certain dates in the, in the day sign read. <clears throat> in the example on the right, he's spearing a, a shield and spears. So this maybe suggests some sort of problem with warfare, some issue with warfare. Maybe it's not a not a good time to engage in battle, or or, or maybe it's a, maybe it's a good time to engage in battle, depending on how you look at it. Um, when Venus appears on certain dates on the on the on the day sign uh, motion, and then and then in this other example, Tlahuitzcalpantecutli um, is actually spearing a, a a woman who's in a pool of water, and you can see there's a there's a turtle and a shell that have also been uh, speared as well, and, and bloods spurting out. And this this seems to relate to the idea of uh, Venus sometimes being associated with droughts. So maybe on the appearance of Venus on um, when when Morning Star starts on one of these uh, crocodile dates, this is when uh, um, there's specific danger of drought or something along those lines. This is actually pretty similar to what's shown in both the Dresden and the Costa de Mexico. On page 10, that, that, uh, that little section of Maya Blue, the skeletal deity has launched a dart and it's sticking into this pool of water. So that, that seems to relate pretty closely to what's happening in the Codex Borgia. And then um, 
in the Codex Dresden, there's a deity that's that's basically speared this uh, supernatural frog or turtle, which is pretty, again, pretty similar to what you see in the Borgia. So these these pages all, all might share a, a common um, relation to prophecy of drought on certain appearances of Venus. Uh, as um, as John Carlson pointed out, um, there's a, a early colonial manuscript called the Codex Teleriano Romensis that notes that Tlawitzkal Pantecutli is not specifically the deity of morning star. He's also associated with the evening star as well. And this is something that's really consistent with um, with the Cosi Maya de Mexico, uh, um, where this book seems to show us, contrary to the other the other codices, that it's not just the first appearance of Venus as morning star that's important. It's really the first appearance of Venus at all four of its different uh, phases. And in fact, we have these deities on the evening star pages uh, of of the Cosi Maya de Mexico, pages ten six. Uh, sorry, two, six, and ten. They're all skeletal beings that look a little bit more like the Tlahuitzcal Pantecutli that we know from Central Mexico. Um, but these are all evening star uh, uh, beings. So um, whereas whereas um, the, the deities that show up on the morning star uh, phase vary in, in the Costa Maya de Mexico. Um, and in fact, uh, um, you have, for example, on page four, a morning star where it's where it's this deity known as Kawil. He also appears as the as the protagonist deity on page one as well. He's got this really distinct curled snout. Uh, for the classic uh, Maya, we know that he was a deity of uh, lightning and rulership. Uh, he, uh, seems to still be related to lightning, although it's not clear if he's still uh, related to rulership by the time the Cosi Maya de Mexico was was made or not. But uh, interesting that he appears in these two different roles. And in fact, in the uh, Codex Dresden, on page 46, he's one of the victims of, of spearing from another Venus deity. So um, a, a really important difference between um, the way the, the Maya in this period were looking at uh, the planet Venus um, compared to how it was looked at in central Mexico for the, um, you know, prior to the arrival of the Spanish, is that it really doesn't seem to be that there's one deity in charge of Venus that oversees Venus uh, for the Maya. In fact, different different deities occupy this role, and in fact, those roles shift to the point where, at least in in, in the example of Kawil, it's possible that this deity, who's an aggressor in one instance, can actually be the victim in another instance. And may, maybe this also might relate to this idea of of a throne being attacked that's in the Codex Borgia, if this deity is still related to rulership at this point. Um, but nonetheless, I, the the way this uh, appears to me is that. Um, the, these are really um, deities that oversee the movements of Venus at different points, and these these particular interactions between an aggressor deity and, and the object or being that it approaches or strains or attacks is is really sort of the 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 potential dynamic that that could happen um, when when Venus enters these different phases on its on its first day. So um, knowing what's happening on this celestial sphere um is is uh, important for people to know um if, if they need to uh, if there's something that humans can do sort of at the center of this 260 day cycle um th that can somehow um avert or 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 um um uh protect against uh, some some sort of harm that might come during uh, venus's appearance at one of these particular phases throughout its 584 day cycle um just a few thanks uh and uh um, I, I hope all of that made sense, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, after this. It's a, I think, a lot of a lot of information to digest, but a really interesting um, study of a of a, um, a manuscript that would otherwise wouldn't have been known if not for um, sort of chance and unfortunate discovery by looters. Of course, it would have been ideal if it would have been found um, excavated by archaeologists, but uh, but nonetheless, I think um, to simply you know damn an object that's um, that appears on the commercial market. As, as a potential fake, um, th there's just so much that can be learned from something like this that uh, that uh, um, that you, you wouldn't know about otherwise. So I think, um, uh, well, yes, yeah, so I'll just I'll just go ahead and leave it at that. So um, I, I, at this point, I, I think I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have or anything like that. Thank you so much, Andrew. That was really um, fascinating and. Uh, uh, very clear uh, exposition, in particular of the of the um, you know celestial movements uh, of, of, of Venus. I, I'm teaching a course right now on um, uh, on di diagrams from the sort of pre-modern um, uh, uh, you know Euro European and uh, Islamic traditions, and 
it's always difficult to to kind of conceptualize uh, some of these uh, planetary movements for for non specialists or people who don't look at the sky on a regular basis. So I, 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 that's really wonderful. Um, uh, we have time for questions, um, uh, and while people are sort of thinking their up their questions, perhaps putting them in the chat or or raising their hand, um, I had a question about whether in the um, is, is, is if it's possible to ascertain from the you know condition of of the codex um, if if there's any sort of signs of use that point to kind of its consultation over time and then uh, related to that if you could sort of speculate a bit as to the sort of uh, the context for its use I mean is it consulted uh, regularly irregularly um, you know, by by one person, by several, and and whether there's any kind of information or or even just speculation about those those things. Yeah, that, those are great questions. Um, I mean, obviously, most of the damage looks like it's kind of more of a preservation issue than a than a use issue. And I don't really know that anybody. I, I would say what um, what survives, you know, looks pretty pristine. Uh, you know, having only seen it in photographs until. You know, a couple of years ago, when I first saw it in person, I was I was really shocked at how, um, you know, despite staining and things like that, the, you know, the, the gesso is just so uniform. The painting is really crisp and clean. And I, I don't really, you know, I don't really, I personally haven't seen anything that looked like, you know, it was handled too much or something like that. It really looks like all the damage that's happened has been the result of, of you know, pests, water, um, you know, decay, that, that type of thing. Um, in terms of who would use it, that that's also kind of a question of speculation. It's it's been argued that this is sort of a provincial book. To me, um, that that may or may not be true. It's, it's whoever, whoever decorated it certainly was a cosmopolitan person in the sense that they they really knew what was happening at Chichen Itza and Tula, I think, and and they also had access to materials that came from pretty far and wide, like Maya blue and this this cochineal that grows on certain types of uh, cactus. Um, there just hasn't really been much excavation in the area to know what were the kind of important sites around the area during this time period. But um, I, I think people want to think that it's like kind of a local priest in a small community. But I, I think this also could have belonged to some sort of a minor, you know, royal polity or something like that in, in the area. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, one thing I would also say in terms of like the the, the black and the red on on white background, I, I think it really lends itself well to being consulted in the dark. Um, you know, the um, I, I was sort of surprised uh, one night working in Belize. Uh, I, I went out for a, a midnight stroll, which I probably shouldn't have done, but the 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 roads were all paved with white stones, and and in the moonlight it just it just glowed. You could really just see where you're going without the need of any sort of a flashlight or anything like that. And um, in fact, for the Maya, they 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 called their roads like the the white path. So I, I think that's a consistent thing. But I think I think that's also kind of hints to the use of these codices a little bit because they're almost invariably they almost invariably let the the white background show through, and I think that really helps you you read it under um circumstances when you would be consulting it and looking where venus is appearing counting days and things like that but i, I think um you know there, there's probably some sort of a religious specialist that's keeping track of the the 260 day cycle and getting up early in the morning and you know watching where venus appears and when it appears and, and carefully consulting these books we have a um, we, have, we have a question in the chat yeah. yeah i see from uh uh barbara williams ellertson uh, um I'll just read it read it out uh, um given that there are 20 day signs how does the 13 day calendar interval correspond to the venus intervals uh and also how fascinating to compare the calligraphic style among the four codices yeah um well okay so um so basically if i'm interpreting the question right the the 260 day calendar is kind of a, a root calendar and then you have this 365 day solar calendar that kind of work together and um for those of you who might be familiar with central Mexico, like the Aztecs, there's this big, huge uh, ceremony at the end of 52 years when basically like the the the, the first the the 260 day calendar and the 365 day calendar link up once again. So these basically cycle through on these, in, you know, kind of independent cycles. And then they, you know, the numbers line up again at the end of 52 years. So th this is kind of an important period for um 
for Mesoamerican peoples, it's probably about uh, an average long-lived person's lifespan. So that's kind of critical. You have that 260 days on one end, which is the you know, conception to birth, and then you have the 52 years on the other end. And uh, for what the Aztecs, for what, what they would do in, in, in uh, Tenochtitlan, Mexico City, is they would basically extinguish all of the fires in the city at, at the, during this new fire ceremony. Um, and then they would, um, you know, smash all of the, you know, like household stone, uh, stone and ceramic um, figures and vessels and things like that for fear during this kind of scary, uncertain time that, uh, you know, that your your household implements might actually attack you and things things like that. So they would extinguish all the fire, they would destroy all, all these uh, ceramic objects and things like that. And then they would um, drill fire on a captive, on, a, on, a, on top of a captive's chest at a place called um, Cerro de la Estrella that's in Iztapalapa, a neighborhood of Mexico City, right at, at this point, but it's basically like a, a mountain that's within now within Mexico City. They would drill f new fire on, on, on the chest of a captive, and if it struck, then, then they would light all the fires uh, again in Mexico City and basically start that 52 year cycle again. If the, the danger was if it didn't strike that the, the sun was at this particularly vulnerable phase where it's sun and earth would be destroyed by a, a star demon. So it kind of like relates to this. Um, kind of like celestial conflict that's always happening and, and, and why the sun just kind of constantly needs um, strength and reinforcement. Um, so that that's kind of, to me, how the 260-day um, year cycle links to the 365-day cycle within this period of 52 years. This all relates to Venus because the, the Venus cycle kind of basically um, takes a full 104 years to go to cycle all the way back through, so that's basically two of these, two of these fifty-two year cycles. So it's kind of like the grand cycle in a, in a way. Um, I, I hope that answered the first part. The second part was on calligraphic traditions. Can you uh, remind me again of of what the question was? Oh, thank you. No, I was I was given given that the codices are from such different areas geographically um, and also I think chronologically. Uh, what similarities do you find in terms of the styles of, of the calligraphy among them? Yeah, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, um, they they all look like they're. I mean, Cosimai de Mexico is really um, it's it's all it's recognizable day signs uh, from the later traditions, but uh, um, they they kind of have their own. The, the scribes have their own distinct way of doing them, um, which which is pretty interesting. The content, nonetheless, is is what's um, kind of well preserved. So it, it it's it's a little bit not not well known. In fact, there was a big conference on this very topic at Dumbarton Oaks in 2010 on kind of the scribal interactions across Mesoamerica because it, it has long been noticed that like uh, among these like kind of varied traditions, there are a lot of um, there's a lot of continuity in terms of uh, themes. Uh, so despite the fact that there's um, differences chronologically and, and major cultural differences, there does seem to be scribal interaction on some on some high level that's taking place. And in fact, um, one of the really interesting things in the Codex Dresden is in those Venus pages, some of the attacking deities are actually what we would consider to be central Mexican deities, and their names are glossed where they, they've taken a Nahuatl name and kind of like done their best to, to transcribe it into a Mayan sounding name. So Shutekutli, for example, becomes Shiwitei um, th things like that. So it's kind of, and th there is a, a god called Tawiskal, which is probably based on Tawiskal Pantekutli. So it's, so, so there's this kind of inter interesting interaction, maybe not so much on a visual level, but certainly on a, a content level. But again, not, not really sure what the mechanism for, for how these ideas are being transmitted is. Um, people have talked about them having like sort of the possibility of Mesoamerican peoples having sort of like big conferences where they get together and sort of recalibrate the calendar and stuff like that. I, I don't know, but you know, it's possible. Uh, fascinating. Um, we have a number of questions in the chat. Um, um, one from Mia Devansa and, and seconded by Jermaine uh, Warkenton about uh, repatriation of the uh, three other codices, whether there's been any discussion of that in light of a uh, recent uh, interest in, in repatriation of objects from, from Western Museum. Gosh, yeah, I, I don't know that there's really been any discussion about those three codices. Um, of course, I, I'm sure most people know that the 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 clincher date is is 1970, and now any object that's you know according to UNESCO accord any audience or any object that's left left its country of origin after 1970 
you know, is considered kind of a illicitly looted object. These these were, of course, spirited out of Mexico sometime shortly after the Spanish arrived, it seems. And it's not, not really clear how that happened. I, I don't know if there's been any discussion of it. Um, uh, th there was an early colonial manuscript that was basically stolen from the Paris library and, and turned up in Mexico. And it was kind of recently agreed that, um, you know, France wasn't really going to follow it up and prosecute it. And, um, you know, it ended up back in, it's it's now in the, the National Library of Anthropology in Mexico City. So um, I, I think they sort of agree that that's, <laughs> that's okay, even though that's not the ideal way to repatriate an object. But um, I, I don't think there's really been any talk about the, the Madrid, the the Dresden and the Paris that I have not, that I know of at least, and I, I think the Dresden is in this really um, kind of unfortunate position right now where it can't even really travel at all without severe the threat of severe damage. Because basically, what happened was that it was um, it was um, stretched out in its length and sandwiched between two pieces of glass and sort of sealed. It was kept in this uh, um, library in Dresden. Dresden was firebombed during World War II, including the library. The codex wasn't burned, but um, I, I think it, the, as they put out the fire, basically my understanding is that water got into the, those, um, those two plates of glass, and basically the codex is sort of like stuck to the glass on both sides. So um, you can't really travel this long piece of glass because it, it's it's so dangerous. It's it's in such risk of breaking, and then you can't really take the glass off either because because the codex is basically stuck to it. So I I don't know if that's something that would necessarily inhibit the possibility of repatriation. It certainly means that it can't, you know, show up in an exhibition or anything like that. But uh, um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's an interesting question for the future, especially as, as it's such a pressing, pressing topic right now. Good news is, is um, you know, th these are all really accessible through publications and things like that and digital copies. So we can all consult them wherever we are in the world. We have a question from Anne de Leon about whether uh, the authenticity of uh, any other um, Mexican codices has been has been questioned. For example, well, the, the Codex Cardona. Yeah, that, that's that's the funny thing is um, thanks to all these studies on the Codex de Maya de Mexico, it's um, it's now probably the most carefully studied Mesoamerican manuscript. Period. So now. Now, um, th there's less reason to doubt its authenticity than there is for any other uh, pre-Hispanic manuscript. I, I don't think anybody, I don't know of anybody trying to claim any pre-Hispanic manuscript is, is in doubt, but there's always, there's always, um, there's always questions like that the Cardona was recently, um, was recently, um, I guess, sort of uh, ruled, de determined a forgery by, by my colleague, Gerardo Gutierrez. He, he basically uh, applied the same battery of tests, but it's. I, I think. I think the issue here for me is that um, I get um, like it's usually pretty easy to spot a bad forgery. Um, I, I've seen quite a few now of, of these, uh, you know, purported Maya codices that are basically like they, they just kind of like take the they they just sort of take things randomly from other other objects of my artwork they don't really have the technique right the colors aren't right i mean there's just a lot of things that don't work about them and they're pretty easy to spot when uh, there aren't really that many i mean it, it you don't see that many really convincing questionable forgeries out there like they're the the bad ones are kind of easy to spot i'm sure they exist but the, the problem is is like when there is an object that's in question like that and people come out and say it's fake it really um, damages the credibility in a way that uh, I, I think um, basically what happened with Costa Maya de Mexico is it you know took about forty years for it to be authenticated, and um, you know and and there's also sort of a costly, time-consuming process to authenticate it, and and this this was an exceptional thing that Mexico did to to authenticate this this codex. It otherwise could have just sort of been lost and lived in doubt forever. So so basically sort of claiming that a questionable object is fake without really going through the, the motions is almost the same as destroying the thing itself. So um, so I, I think um, it's it's always worth inquiring, but I think now, especially now that we have all these non-invasive ways of of examining a, an object, I, I think, um, you know, it's, you know, good good to be cautious, but I think making these bold claims that something is, is fake or real uh, without really going through the motions, I think is kind of a kind of bad practice at this point. And uh, pursuant to that, we have a question from Melissa Moriton about um, whether anyone has tried to image uh, the fused plaster codex uh, uh, you mentioned at the beginning. Um, 
you know, this has been attempted on uh, some of the carbonized uh, scrolls from uh, around Pompeii. Um, but I wonder if, if, is that a technique that, um, that has been used or if there's ever discussion of that for that particular archeological find? I don't, I don't know that anybody, at least in the fused one, what, what happened was um, there was a conservator in the 1970s that um, he was able to remove some layers off of it, but it was basically at such a, at such a cost where it was basically, he, he just thought it wasn't really worth doing because it was just damaging the damaging it too bad to do it. But I think they weren't really able to do any sort of uh, imaging on the level of what could be possible today. And I, I don't really know that anybody's really Really brought that up again. Um, Nicholas Carter and Jeffrey Doberiner, as I mentioned, um, did do that study on the Washington one, but the the fused one, I think, um, I'm not even really sure where it is. It's probably in a in a storehouse somewhere in Mexico. But uh, that that would be interesting to to look into that again and see if it could be done. It'd be great to. I mean, that that would be an even older codex. So basically, Costa Maya de Mexico now is now the oldest Mesoamerican codex by by a good you know um, two or three hundred years. But but that one from El Mirador is you know is probably you know um, a good seven hundred years older than that. But um, who knows if anything could be pulled out of it or not? But it'd be interesting to see. And then uh, perhaps a final question, since we're coming up to uh, to one thirty, um, uh, from Nick Wilding, um, who asks, "What happened to the other artifacts, masks, box, dagger that were in the cave? And if they're ex extant, do they fit chronologically and?" uh semiotically with with codex well that's a that's a fantastic question and it's something i i actually um uh thought about putting into the talk but kind of opted out because it's 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 pretty complicated but the 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 quick answer is the the objects are kind of a hodgepodge so there's there's one um there's a box that uh so so basically it seems it seems like science was basically like offloading all these objects when when and when when the exhibition took place in 1971 and he'd already gotten rid of some of them so there was a a dagger with a wooden handle that ended up in the Princeton Art Museum um a turquoise encrusted wooden mask ended up at Dumbarton Oaks a gold foil covered mask ended up at Chicago Art Institute there was a child sandal and a piece of rope that ended up in the the um, Israeli National Museum. There was um, um, this uh, really fine wooden box with carved imagery and glyphs on it that's now in the Kislak collection of the Library of Congress. That that one definitely does not fit in the same time period as Costa Maya de Mexico because it's actually got a named ruler and some dates on it, and it, it dates to the seventh century. So you know we're talking. A good four or five hundred years before the Costa Maya de Mexico. Supposedly, these objects were all found in the cache together. Does this does this imply, if that's true, does it imply that they were um, heirloom objects that were then eventually buried with the same person? Or, um, you know, we know that 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 cave ritual, cave use, is something that's multi generational in Mesoamerica and really, really, really important. Or is this a cave that was just entered multiple times and different objects were put in there at different points? Hard to say. Um, the, the one of the stories that that seems like it's kind of fantastic is that um, the looters basically went into this cave and found a big box with some carvings on it, and inside that box was all the other stuff. But it was cold that night, and they needed to you know stay warm, so they burned the big box for firewood, which to me sounds completely implausible. And I don't think it gets like that cold there um, to where you'd actually need to destroy some kind of potentially really valuable object like that. But uh, um, that's kind of the story we're left with at this point. The the objects, if 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 they are, if they were all found together, it's it's um kind of interesting to speculate how the, all those objects might work together as potentially heirloom objects or maybe ritual objects that were used by one particular ritual practitioner or ruler or priest, however you might want to define them, um, or is or are these just objects that were placed in an important cave that hasn't been located yet and possibly might not exist anymore. Um, uh, that just sort of found their way in there over over many generations, many over over centuries. It's it's an interesting question. Well, uh, thank you, Andrew. Those are uh, some it was some wonderful uh, discussion and 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 wonderful answers to those questions and and a wonderful talk. So thank you very much uh, for that. And again, the talk uh, will be will be posted um, in in due course on our on our on the Sims YouTube page and uh, I'll remind everyone about uh, the edited volume that uh, that Andrew published uh, last year um, 
at, with the Getty. Um, so uh, if you're if you're curious if you're curious about uh, this amazing uh, object, uh, do please look out for that uh, book. And um, and I think with that we'll we'll close uh, today's uh, online lecture. So thank you all for attending and have a wonderful afternoon, uh, morning, or night wherever you are. Thank you.